My name is Kim Robin. I am a faculty member in the School of Public Health and Health Services here at GW. Um, I am a public health nutritionist, a registered dietitian. Um, so I am, of course, very interested in food and nutrition related issues, um, as is Jose, the course instructor. Um, I'm going to be serving as the course director for this course. Um, I think you all know that uh, Chef Jose Andres is really the creator and the instructor of this course. Unfortunately, he is a super busy guy doing all of the great things that he does in the world. Um, besides running his business, he's also a really great humanitarian and working on a lot of different um, projects around the world. And right now, he's somewhere in the Caribbean, I think, <laughs> in the Cayman Islands. Um, so unfortunately, he's not able to be with us today. But he did send us a personal video, which we will be showing you all in just a few minutes. Um, as a welcome to the course, and he will be here next week for you. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Andres, and I want to welcome you to this amazing class, The World on a Plate. Uh, really, really excited. Um, I cannot be with you today on the first class. Yes, I know, I know. Oh, how is possible that Jose is not here on the first class? Well, I travel around the world, that's what I'm supposed to do because I have to keep learning if I want to keep sharing what I learn with all of you. So no problem because you are in good, good hands. You are with professor who uh, we do a great team, Kim Robin, who she's going to be very much uh, co-leading this class with me over the next weeks. And she's amazing. She's excellent. Uh, uh, smart like not many people I know and one of the most amazing is Miles. So when she talks, you listen because it's something amazing to learn from her. Assisting her is going to be an amazing TA who is also the director of the food initiatives at George Washington, Danita Altieri. She's awesome. She's making sure that George Washington will become the most powerful food university in America. Believe me, we will become the most powerful university when we're talking about food and the connection of food and the entire world. And this is what this class is all about, to find the synergies between food and everything we look around. When you look at the hospital, I want you to be thinking about food. When you look at the Pentagon, I want you to be thinking about food. When you see a marketing ad on TV, I want you to be thinking about food. When you see a restaurant, I want you to be thinking about the jobs that restaurant creates and all the great input that does for the economy. Food is very much at the heart of everything we are as humans. We are who we are because food helps us become taller and smarter. And our planet will become whatever it becomes if we are smart in using the goodness of the earth in the right way. So if you're wondering where Jose Andres is today, this will be something like um, where is Waldo kind of approach. I'm probably in the Caribbean. I'm not in Haiti this time. I just came back from there. I am in the Cayman Islands. And I'm actually working, believe it or not, I'm gonna be scuba diving. I'm gonna be hunting for uh, the lionfish, which is an invasive species, not only in the Caribbean, but around the world. But then, serious business. Today, first class, food as a business. We need to understand that food moves billions of dollars in America and around the world, employs millions of people generates a lot of income, a lot of taxes. Wow, food is everything. Today we have a very unique person because we have a good friend, uh, Nicolas Jamé. Yes, his mother is French, a reader. I know her very well. Lovely person. Uh, her and her husband own La Carabelle, one of the most iconic French restaurants in New York, in America, in the world. And Nicolas, don't use this against him, graduated in 2007 from a university called Georgetown University. 
Do you know where it is? The business school. The same year he graduated, he opened an amazing concept, Sweet Green, with a simple idea that the goodness of the earth in its raw state could be an agent of change in the fast food restaurants of the world. Today, even people like Steve Case of American Online fame, through his new company, Revolution, has invested heavily in Sweet Green. So, something is changing in the air. Hot dogs and burgers may not be the only player in the fast food business, but salads that brings you the best that the earth can give you with good toppings, good dressings, are the new game in town. Not only Washington, but opening in places as far as Boston, New York, and very soon around America and probably around the world. So if somebody can share with us today the power of food as a business and especially as a new business, this is Nicolas. So help me welcome everybody. Today is the first day. I hope you're going to have a great class and I hope to see you in the next one. Use your time wisely. We need you and the food business of the world needs you. So let's have a great semester. See you soon. Adios. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be scuba diving, working, working. I am so excited that we have Nick here today. I think he is the perfect person to kick this off and totally embodies Jose's mission for this course. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. So my freshman year, about a month into school, I was standing in line at the bursar's office, or the, one of the financial offices, and a few friends and I had figured out a loophole in the uh, dining plan meal. You could trade in your meal plan for the cash that your parents paid. So we figured this out, so one of the seniors had told us, so we rushed over to the bursar's office and said, we'd like to trade in our meal plans, because we had eaten there a few times and didn't really enjoy it. So we traded it in, got a check for, I think it was about $1,500. So freshman year, a month in, it's a big check. And we're like, wow, this is gonna last us the whole semester. This is great, we're gonna go eat at great restaurants, we're gonna you know, maybe order some alcohol when we're out, who knows. And about halfway through the semester, we ran out of money, obviously. And uh, we started, uh, when we started to run out of money, we started to go out to, um, to cook meals instead of going out to restaurants. And so it became this kind of, more social interaction around our food freshman year, where we'd get a bunch of friends together in the dorm, in the, you know, those little kitchens with the microwaves, and we'd cook a meal for our classmates. And that was one of my first interactions with kind of a failure in the food business, uh, in, the, in the business of food at school. You know, these institutions were set up to feed us, and they were feeding us, but, you know, not what we wanted to eat, and that was kind of when a spark went off, and for the next couple of years, we were thinking, there's gotta be something better to eat. And so, hi, my name is Nicholas Jamey, and I uh, founded a company called Sweet Green when I was at Georgetown. I founded it with two classmates, my two best friends, John and Nate. And uh, together, senior year, we came up with this business plan. And I hope you guys realize how incredibly lucky you are to have a class like this. Um, there's lots of classes like this, not just in food and politics and culture and entrepreneurship, but those classes are incredible, and you know, we, I wish we had access to as many classes as that. But at Georgetown, everyone becomes a banker or a consultant. And there's not much, well, back then. Today, it's a very different school, and I'm very proud of it. And I go back and speak there many times, and I love it. But back then, everyone around us, uh, no one really had this spark of entering the food business. And the business of food wasn't a career option. So senior year, with John and Nate, we wrote a business plan. And there was one class at Georgetown. It was called entrepreneurship. And that was just it. There was intro, advanced, everything. It was just one class you took. And we took that class, and you were able to write a business. They taught you how to write a business plan, think about creating a business, whatever industry it was in. And you weren't allowed to do restaurants. You could, you could write a business plan about anything you wanted except restaurants. And I understood why they did that, because the idea of just saying, I'm going to open a bar was not the way they wanted to think about creating a business. So after the class was done, we wrote this business plan and started to really think about 
what we wanted to do. And, and the reason Sweet Green came about was because we simply had a problem in our daily lives. We had nowhere to eat. We'd have this conversation, this fight every day. We'd watch our girlfriends fight about where to eat or you know, go get another sandwich at Wise Miller's or Bowie's. Or there was like those four spots in Georgetown where people normally ate. And that was a problem to us. We wanted better options. We wanted to have food experiences that fit our lifestyle, that fit our passions, that, that were just healthy or traceable or honest and cool at the same time. So we said, great, we'll create it. Uh, John and Nate also come from entrepreneurial families and I also grew up in an entrepreneurial family so it was natural for us to say, let's just create it. So we started writing a business plan, raising money, um, raised money from friends and family, lots of kids that were in our entrepreneurship class and little by little things started to come together. Um, we hired a contractor, hired an architect and uh, we wrote a business plan that was going to become a reality called Greens. Um, we quickly learned that because of trademark laws, we couldn't protect the name Greens, so after an, a late night brainstorm session, it became Sweet Green. And so Sweet Green was born. Uh, the first thing we did was make t-shirts, so we all wore Sweet Green t-shirts to every class for about three months straight. And that for us was what made it real. That was the first kind of you know, physical piece of uh, Sweet Green we had. A lot, of, a lot of kids in our class didn't really either believe us or they just thought it was kind of a fun project that we'd get sick of by May because, you know, we'd then go out into the real world and get real jobs. But lo and behold, Sweet Green started, uh, we started construction. And if any of you have seen this, this is a tiny, tiny uh, little 500 square foot house on M Street, which is where we opened our first Sweet Green. That little brick house in the right corner is where we lived senior year. So we lived around the corner from this and we walked by it every day sitting empty as we'd have this conversation about where to eat. So finally we said, this is perfect, we're gonna do it here. 500 square feet, we didn't know if that was too big or too small, we didn't know what that meant. We said, we'll do it here. Called the landlord every day for 30 days, she wouldn't take a meeting with us. Uh, my business partner, John, is extremely, extremely persistent, so finally the landlord agreed to take a meeting if he would just stop calling her. So finally, uh, one thing led to another. She, she liked us, she felt the passion, she was very curious about this idea we had about creating a healthy, honest, clean place to eat. And she gave us a shot. She let us sign the lease. She introduced us to architects, contractors, and uh, August 2007, two months after graduation, we opened our doors. And by that time, all of our friends had left campus, everyone had left DC, they were off either traveling the world or you know, starting at Goldman or whatever it was and we were here you know, running the cash register <laughs> selling salads. And, but it was the most fun we ever had in our whole life. We were learning so much every day about every part of the food business. Where to buy the food from, how to prepare the food, how to train staff, how to find staff. And it really was an incredible first year because we learned everything by doing it. And we also surrounded ourselves with incredible mentors and you know, our parents were really helpful, but the three of us did it. You know, we, we sat there working in the store every single day and learned the business of food ourselves. And I think that was a really important um, point in our careers. So fast forward today, we have 22 stores uh, in New York, Boston, DC, Philly, and you know, hopefully we'll, we will keep expanding. But um, a lot of what we learned and a lot of what Sweet Green is came out of this little green house. Everything, a lot of what we learned about food came from this little house. Early on, we realized that for us to really create an impact in the business of food, we almost had to not think like a food business. Seeing everything that was already out there, we saw a kind of a lack of innovation, a lack of um, change. And so we had to almost take cues from other industries and not think like a food business. If we felt like a food business, we would just be like everyone else. And so as we looked at the greater goal of what we wanted to do and create impact in food, it wasn't just to sell food, it wasn't to sell salad, it wasn't to make sure people were eating 300 fewer calories every meal. It was about a real change, it was about creating this lifestyle that people could connect to. And it wasn't just about the food. It was this idea of living well and enjoying your life and being able to make good decisions and feel good about it, have fun and eat healthy. And this greater lifestyle that we have now, we have a word for it, we call it the sweet life. But it's a bit, you know, whether it's fluffy or not, it's this idea that really drove everything we did at Sweet Green and drove the culture we built. So it's not just about 
a meal that's convenient. It's not just about fast food that's healthy. Um, early on, we decided to create a culture that was rooted in more than that. And so now today you look and one of the biggest things we say is we don't sell food. You know, we create experiences for customers and we try to ha be the best place to work. So you know, creating experiences for customers is one thing, but that means nothing if you don't have the team and the family and um, the actual employees that, that make that happen. So we've really become a business focused on culture and thinking about the way we build this team in the business of food. Um, I think I read somewhere that almost 10% of the workforce is related to food somehow. That's incredible. I mean, food is around us everywhere. And people, whether it's you know, the food you're eating when you know, you're at the movie theaters or for dinner or shopping at the grocery store or even the hospital, food is everywhere. It's something that you will never not need. You know, it's not like the, the DVD player that went out of, you know, that obviously technology uh, surpassed it, but food is something that we as humans need. It's part of us. It's part of what obviously keeps us going. So for us to create a sustainable company that's rooted in more than just food and really creating this culture that people spoke to was our goal from day one. So the business of food, apart from just building this bigger culture, well, which I'll, I'll talk a bit about again in a second, but the biggest thing that we have really tried to do and this is how we've tried to think a little differently in, in, our, in our industry, our space, is really thinking about how technology can be leveraged in the food space to really push innovation. When a lot of people think of the food business, you know, it's a very basic function. It can be very mercantile, very transactional. You make food, you sell it. But for us, um, and for a lot of people in, in the industry now, they're able to leverage technology in a really exciting way at every level of the food process, every level of the business of food. Um, this was a funny photo from the day before we opened our stores, our doors in Georgetown. And it's when we realized that uh, the magnetic menu boards wouldn't stick to the wall. <laughs> and I think John's on the phone with the contractor saying, go buy it. The stainless steel isn't magnetic. I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I think Nate just cursed really loudly. But uh, again, this idea that for us early on, I think at this point is when we really, really realized that we couldn't just think like everyone else. Um, so today when you look at the ways we try to leverage technology in the fast casual industry, it's incredible to see how different we operate today even from six years ago when we started. Um, opening in New York, I'll give you an example. Opening in New York, we had to rebuild our supply chain. So we had to find local farmers, we had to find new producers, we had to really rebuild our local supply chain um, because a lot of our food is local. So years ago when we did this in DC, we'd go to the farmer's market, we'd ask other chefs, we'd you know, very relationship driven. You have to go out there and seek it and build it. You know, today there's a ton of incredibly useful uh, digital platforms that connect farmers and restaurants. So we use a, a company called Farmers Web. They um, asked us all these inputs about what kind of ingredients we're looking for, what volume, where we're from, what we're looking for, and it spat out a list of farmers that connected to us. You can then even order on that site and it comes straight to your door. So this is just six years later. It's incredible to see the innovation that's happened in the business of food and how it's even affected our business. Um, so technology at every level of our business is really what drives a lot of our decisions and drives a lot of the experience we try to create. Even the way we interact with our customers, um, merchandising, marketing, messaging, the way we digitally you know, converse with our customers has changed so much in the past six years. So I think that at the end of the day, we started with a problem a problem of uh, having nowhere to eat. And we tried to create a culture and leverage technology to change that and really do something different in the business of food. Um, you guys are seeing a lot of photos from our old days, but this is uh, when we opened our second store in DuPont Circle. Our Georgetown store at this point had been humming, doing really well, getting great reviews, you know, making great money. And we opened our second store way bigger in the heart of DC and we're like, great, we're gonna make so much money. This store is gonna kill it. And on opening day, uh, we made almost no money. Opening week was pretty much the same thing. And week after week, we just had no customers. And so this is the point where the three of us are starting to freak out saying, okay, great, we're gonna have to go get real jobs. We're gonna have to kind of quit this whole thing. And we decided that we needed to think about trying to talk to our customers in a different way. You know, we didn't want to send out like 
email flyers to people's doors or you know, emails or to newsletters to people's doors or we didn't want to just put an ad out. Or For us, we wanted to think about how we could connect with our customers differently and support the business we're in. So Nate, one of my business partners, is a DJ on the side. So we decided to go to Guitar Center, buy a big speaker, put it outside the store, and just DJ and sample food, invite our farmers out, create this kind of experience outside the store <clears throat> that would invite customers in and let them know what we're about. Really simple. At the time, we thought it was brilliant. And uh, little by little, we did this every weekend. And it started to work. Um, these became little gatherings outside the stores. People would then come in and eat. You'd see them coming back at night. Little by little, we were able to convert customers. And for us, a loyal customer is something that's incredibly valuable because a loyal customer will come in two to three times a week. So we knew that if we could just get them in the store, that they'd be hooked, they'd love what we were about, they'd love the business that we were creating, and they'd come back. So little by little, this you know, took up all of our weekends. We had a lot of fun. And uh, the reason I show you this is because this has now become one of a, almost a separate business or a part of our, our sweet green business that has uh, grown quite quickly uh, into a music festival. So this, is, this was the birth of this festival we threw out called Sweet Life Festival. Um, a year after this, we threw a little block party behind the store and invited all of our farmers and some local musicians and threw a block party. Uh, again, to engage the community, to connect with our customers. Um, and it was incredibly successful. 300 people came. We thought that was huge. The next year, we had it again with 800 people. And we decided we wanted to blow it up even more. People love this idea of connecting food and music and, and using that, how emotional music was to connect with a brand that stood for something. And so the next year, we decided to do it even bigger. And one thing led to another. And, um, all of a sudden, we found ourselves at Meriwether Post Pavilion with 13,000 people and the Strokes headlining. And uh, that was not the plan for the year, but somehow that's how it ended up. And it was the idea that we could challenge the way people threw music festivals and ate at music festivals. So it was, a, you know, it was a rock concert with the Strokes and Girl Talk, which you see here. But for Sweet Green to throw this festival, we took over concessions. We changed out the food. We brought in farmers. We brought in chefs. Um, we brought in food producers that we were proud of that fit the food ethos of Sweet Green. We served Sweet Green food at the festival. We served local microbreweries and, and, and changed the whole idea of what an experience, a food experience, and the business of food was at a festival. And again, we are not in the music festival business, but for us, this has become a big part of the way we talk to our customers and the way we engage our customers. We've been able to create an event that celebrates everything we do in a very non-traditional way. Uh, we are actually announcing the lineup this year uh, in about a week. So. so again, about six years has gone by, um, and John, Nate, and I are still running Sweet Green <laughs> and continuing to grow it and uh, really thinking about our place and our impact in the business of food. And as we've gone to different cities, we've really learned a lot about the food system and how broken it is in some places. But, uh, and it's really incredible to see in this five years, and even in the past couple decades, how much has changed with consumers and information. You know, with obviously we all grew up with internet and any you know, piece of information at our fingertips. But decades ago, that wasn't a reality. People didn't know as much about their food. They weren't connected to their food. You guys can know anything about your food you want. You guys can really learn anything about any ingredient, where it came from, who grew it, um, how long it was grown for. And that's a fairly new thing when you look at the food industry. So consumers are a lot smarter today than they were a few decades ago. Consumers are a lot smarter today than they were five years ago. Um, I remember it wasn't until a few months in that someone came in and said, I can't have gluten. I said, what is that? And today, you know, 20, 30% of our customers have some sort of gluten intolerance. And uh, so it's incredible to see with the amount of information that's out there, how curious customers have become, how curious consumers are about their food. And that all leads back to this idea of just being connected to your food, wanting to know where your food came from that you're putting in your body. Years ago, that wasn't a reality. And a lot of that curiosity and transparency is what has driven our business. And it's, and it's forced us to really ask a lot of questions about everything we buy, build, produce, and, and we should always be asking those questions. The business of food is always going to be evolving. 
And uh, a second ago, I, a minute ago, I talked about this idea of why do we do what we do? We don't really see ourselves as selling food. For us, it's trying to create this bigger lifestyle where food is a part of it, but it's more about living this lifestyle that you can feel passionate about and live healthy but still enjoy it. So for us, our, you know, our purpose, our why, what drives us is not to sell food, to sell salads. For us, it's this idea of creating experiences where passion and purpose come together. And that, that just means that it's this idea that you can have your cake and eat it too. You can live healthy, a healthy lifestyle, but have fun. You can you know, eat something healthy at a rock festival. You can have you know, food that you think tastes good four nights a week at a price you can afford. And so that has been the ethos that's driven everything we've done. That's our why. We happen to just have restaurants, make juice, and have music festivals. And as a business that's, that's mission-driven, it's really important for us in the food business to have this mission at the core of everything we do and make sure everyone understands it. And when I say everyone, I mean especially the people that work for us. Um, you know, we have a team of about 620 people now, and it's much bigger than the three of us when we started in the beginning. It's not about us anymore, it's about the 620 people, the, the 620 jobs we created in the food business and how we treat them and how they feel about coming to work every day, what they learn about food, what they tell the customers about food. It's really much more than the three of us. So our sole mission now, you know, one of our biggest goals is to really think about this team and this, this, uh, this group of employees we've created and, and think about how we teach them and how they feel about working at Sweet Green. Um, I'm gonna show you guys a video now that explains uh, our approach and uh, kind of our culture. I remember standing there looking at this space. It was so small, but you could see it. You can just imagine this experience that you could create inside. And when we saw that little tavern, we knew that was the right spot for it. Looking back years later, we never would have imagined that we'd be part of this bigger community of farmers, of customers, of employees. When this all began, the goal was simple to connect with people through food. Sweet Green was born when we were still students. The three of us really bonded over the fact that there was something missing in our daily life. We had nowhere healthy to eat. When we started Sweet Green, nobody really believed that it would work. We really had no idea what we were doing. We wanted to create something healthy that was fun. And wouldn't it be cool if there was a place that fit our values? We shared this passion for creating something, and we just decided to close our eyes and do it. We really focused on creating a farm table experience and educating customers that their food's locally sourced. In the early days, we started simply by just going straight to farmer's markets and meeting farmers at their stands. Years later, some of those initial connections we made at the farmer's market are some of our strongest partners. For us, we really believe in making an impact in the communities where we open. The big thing we've done this past couple years is a program called Sweet Green in Schools, where we go into the public school system and educate fourth graders just on healthy eating. It's been a really exciting way to get around the community, and we look forward to taking it with us everywhere Sweet Green goes. When we opened our second store, not doing any business, bought a giant speaker, set up outside on the sidewalk, something magical happened. It was no longer just a place to eat. We did our first block party, and it was incredible. The block party turned into a bigger block party, which turned into our first festival, which was maybe 500 people. The next year, we found these incredible partners. We had the opportunity to take a big gamble. When you think about the Sweet Life Festival, it's really a party with a purpose, where we bring together 20,000 like-minded people to listen to amazing music while eating healthy food and giving back to a great cause. see this is just the beginning. And as we grow, we can't wait to spread this idea of a sweet life and living well, bring this to new communities and build new partnerships. We want people to think about eating healthy in a different way. It's easy, it's fun, it's approachable. We want to make sure that we create an impact in the community, with the customers, and with the farm. What really excites us, it's not just the food, it's not just the music, it's to create experiences where passion and purpose come together.
as I said in the beginning, what, what, why we started Tweaker is because we had a problem and we wanted to solve it. So I urge you guys, as you guys come to class every week and you learn about every different side of the business of food, whether it's food access, waste, sourcing, nutrition, try to think of a problem that relates to you. And if you want to enter the business of food, starting with a problem is a great place to start. Thank you. Yeah. See, I knew this would be inspirational. Um, uh, we saw this on. Oh, I'm going to leave that with you because you're going to need it. So we have time for questions. Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, yeah, I feel like you've given us a really good vision of where C Sweet Green has come from. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you envision it go going or what you envision changing or anything like that in the coming years. We've recently opened in New York and Boston. and. The goal is to just keep growing Sweet Green one neighborhood at a time, one community at a time. Not going too fast, making sure we can keep doing all the stuff we do. And just staying very focused on the mission, so kind of slow and steady. What does sustainability mean to you and your company? Good question. So sustainability for us means a few different things. Um, you saw quickly in the video this list of core values popped up. Those are our five Sweet Green core values. and. Every employee that comes has to memorize them and live by them, and, and we're very serious about them. And one of them is this phrase, think sustainably. And it doesn't just mean, you know, do what's environmentally friendly um, or do, you know, something green. It, the, the greater meaning is doing something that's greater for the long run. So making a decision today that will make sense in 10 years. It's not about short-term profits. It's about longer-term value and gains. And so every decision we make, we try to think of, is this sustainable? Is this something that we want as part of our business? Is this a good decision for the community? Not just this year, but you know, 10 years out, 20 years out. And so just making sure that a lot of your decisions are more long-term minded. Obviously, getting local products was very important to you. I was wondering if you all look into your supply chain of those people further to understand kind of their corporate social responsibility at all? We're not just focused on local, we're focused on you know, we have a whole food ethos that has a bunch of criteria, so local, organic, um, fair trade, whatever it may be, but we try to go as far back in the supply chain as we can uh, and be proud of the ingredients we, we source. Obviously, you can't go back and, you know, to every ingredient, but um, it's obviously a big part of every ingredient. For example, the meats you serve, you know, what are they serving the animals? And so we do go far back as that, and uh, the bigger we grow, hopefully the, the more we'll kind of dig into our supply chain further and further. I was just wondering if you have any food waste at the end of the day and what you do with that food waste if you do have food waste. Good question. So we do have some food waste, but not that much. Everything at Sweet Green is prepared in each restaurant every day, full scratch cooking, uh, and it's done on kind of a rotational prep schedule. So your kind of aim is to prep what you need for the day. So at the end of the day, there is some amount of you know avocados or some meats left over. Um, but not very much at all. So, and we do track waste as a percentage of our sales. Um, we track that week to week. So our goal is always to minimize that. You had talked about moving out of DC and what a challenge that was moving on to other locations. How does that impact some of your things like managing food waste? And um, you had talked a little bit about how that affects the food supply chain. But do you, what are the biggest differences you find from different localities? And do you have to have different policies at different locations? Good question. For us, I think the biggest difference, which does affect everything in the business, but is the people and the labor force city to city. And we've been lucky enough to spend, uh, you know, when we signed our leases in New York and Boston, we immediately went there and tried to kind of scope out what the labor force was like and find some local uh, managers that we could move back to DC and teach them about the sweet life and teach them about everything we do. But that's probably the biggest difference from city to city. Uh, the first step for us is always finding people that believe in the purpose, that believe in the core values. And that's tough when you're hiring hourly workers, when you're hiring a couple hundred workers. Um, but we, up until now, we've been able to do it, so we hope that will continue to be that way. You mentioned that this started um, in an entrepreneurship class and you wrote a business plan. I was just wondering to what extent like, you had it planned out. Did you have like, your network set up? Did you have like, all your resources? Or did you kind of like, figure things out as they went along? So we learned how to write a business plan in the, in the business plan, in the entrepreneurship class, but we weren't allowed to do restaurants, so we wrote the Sweet Green business plan after that. And actually, the three of us took the class in different semesters. So senior year in the first semester, we started writing the business plan outside of the class. 
But the class did teach us everything from how to reach out to investors, to getting the right advisory board, raising money, building a P&L. Um, so we learned a lot from that class. Would you say there was any other class that you took that might have influenced uh, you and your partners in your decision to pursue Sweet Green? At the time I was taking it, I didn't know, but uh, there was a class called Management Strategy, which was operations management. And obviously our business is a uh, fairly complex operation. So looking back today, a lot of the, the analysis we do of our operation were things and basic principles we learned in that class. So I wish I had paid more attention in that class. Um, what mechanism, if any, do you have for channeling creativity outside of the top of kind of you three who really run it? How do you pull creativity up from the rest of your business? Part of, the, part of our culture, both in the treehouse, which is what we call the corporate office, we have about 32 people there now, is this idea of collaboration. So having a very flat organization and allowing departments to really work together. We have one big open office and we always urge people to work more in teams and not you know, departments so that we, there is a little more cross collaboration. And it's worked really well so far. We try to get as much feedback from the managers as possible, so get them, getting them out of the stores. Um, and obviously getting them out of the stores has other benefits. Getting them to the festival or to our Sweet Green in Schools program helps a lot, makes them happier. Um, but for us, kind of the feedback loop is really important, so at every level of the organization, down from you know, the dishwasher up to the president. What was one of the things when you kind of just got jumped into the food business, what was one of the things that um, kind of an unexpected obstacle that you encountered that you didn't really think about earlier, which ended up being a big deal in your whole business? So probably the biggest lesson we learned that first year that we had no idea when we opened our store was just the importance of the people you hire and the people you surround yourselves with. Uh, not just in terms of your team, but in terms of your advisors. Um, our employees early on, we, we learned the hard way that first year about finding people that actually believe in what you're doing and can, and can be part of the team. And uh, that was really a tough challenge. And, and then at that point is also learning how to invest in them and develop them and, and build them into the organization for the long term. There's nothing more valuable than having a team member or employee that works with you for you know, years and years and years. And we still have some people that started with us at the first store. And it's, it's the most powerful thing in the world to have people there part of the company for a long time. Um, you talked about uh, not thinking like a food business in the original creation of Sweetgreen. What was it that was unattractive to you about the way other food businesses were operating? So there were things about the food business that obviously we, we loved, but looking at this fast food, fast casual segment we were going into, we saw a lot of the same thing, um, whether it was just in the technology they were using at point of sale or the menu boards or you know what they served and how they served it, how they sourced it. Um, so a lot of that we wanted to challenge. Um, looking at even just the idea of this 560 square foot hut, everyone told us in the beginning we were out of our minds that we, should, we could not open a restaurant in 500 square feet. It was a, you know, a concrete blocks with no, no plumbing, no electricity. We had to bring all that to the space. So today, if we looked at a space like that, we would never open it. But because we had a space that was so small, it forced us to really think a lot simpler and it forced us to be simpler with the concept and think differently about the way we designed it, the food we serve, the technology we used. Uh, so we attribute a lot of the, some of the principles we've applied to Sweetgreen from this first little store. But looking to not just what we didn't like, it wasn't more about what we didn't like about the food business, it was more about taking some innovative cues from other spaces. So looking at companies like Lululemon and the culture they've built, looking at Whole Foods, which is still in food but on the grocery side. So just trying to take as much inspiration and, and lessons from other businesses that are, be, um, that are winning in their categories. Who comes up with the different um, salad combinations and what's the favorite thing you have on your menu? So we, we have a food and beverage team, and uh, they plan the menu out a few months in advance. They work with the farmers, um, a supply chain team, so they work with the farmers to see what they're growing, how much of it we need, how to get it to the stores, and then they plan the menus around that. At this point, we kind of have the calendar down for the year. We know that strawberries and asparagus will be the first things out of the ground in anywhere between April or June. And uh, so we do have a food and beverage team that comes up with it. My favorite thing on the menu is probably the new uh, uh, the seasonal salad that we change every month. So right now it's a, uh, it's a kimchi salad with a local kimchi that we found from one of the producers at the farmer's market.
Although that you do have great values, but in the end, Sweet Green um, is a business. How do you deal with um, competitors, and how do you um, want customers to keep coming back for more? So we look at competition in a very friendly light. You know, we welcome it. We think that other people that are pushing the boundaries and trying to get people to eat healthy only helps our cause. And uh, so we look at it very friendly. You know, we, we were not a cutthroat, very aggressive type of a competitor. Uh, we think if we're all after this greater mission, it's probably for the greater good. Um, in terms of keeping our customers, we try to keep our blinders on and not be too distracted by what the competitors are doing. Our big goal is just to create these connections, create engagement, just make sure we have a really close connection with our customers, and that will keep them coming back. And you do that through everything from the seasonal salads or music or the festivals, experiences. You know, the way we communicate with them at every level keeps that engagement there for us. Jose tipped off that your mother is in the food industry. Um, did it, do you think it helped having that family connection in the food industry? Could those of us who don't have relatives working in the food industry get into the food industry and be as successful as you are? It was a huge help, absolutely. And not just my parents, but my two business partners. Their parents were extremely helpful and supportive, and, and it, it was really, really a big thing for us in the beginning to have their support. Um, my parents were in the very fine dining part of the restaurant industry, so we learned a lot about hospitality and how to talk to customers. Uh, and you know, our parents were all there helping us learn the rest, but uh, we definitely couldn't have done it without them, so. All right, do we have any last questions? Otherwise, I really want to thank Nick one more time. Let's give him a big round.